Christina? Are you differentiating between um, traditional incapacity, um, like dementia, or to mental illness? Is wow. There anything is there a here? differentiation? No, I mean, I think incapacity is defined in these documents as the inability to manage your financial affairs independently. That's a very broad definition. So it could be because you are suffering from dementia, Alzheimer's, old age and forgetfulness, and you're, you're on QVC 24 hours a day spending down your child's inheritance on things that you don't need, which we've seen happen, or you're giving money away to the nursing home attendant. You know, that's incapacity. Or you could be suffering from depression, manic depression, bipolar, uh, we have a lot of clients who have that situation where their children or their spouse or whatever may be suffering from that. We've even had you know, even more adverse events happen as a result of that. So the question is, at what point do you plan for that and how do you plan for it? I don't know if I answered your question. But yes, you, you don't necessarily differentiate it, you just wanna make sure it's covered. These issues have to be covered, whether it's a child or you or your spouse. You need to cover it. You need to cover the eventuality. If it's not currently in existence, it may never come into existence, but it might. And so how much planning do you have to do? Do you need to build a special needs trust into every plan? Question four, and we'll be done in probably five to 10 minutes. So hang in there if you want. Um, are we going to minimize death tax or inheritance tax following your death. Don't forget that life insurance is included in the estate even though it's not subject to income tax generally unless it's segregated and put into a separate irrevocable life insurance trust and certain requirements are met. Don't forget that retirement assets are included in the estate for estate tax purposes, death tax. Question five, if you've got a revocable trust in place, is it fully funded? This is my big uh, push with all of our clients, even after we've done the documents and we're doing the estate planning updates, we wanna make sure that they've done everything that they can either to get their assets into the trust or directed to the trust or an IRA legacy trust or some other type of non-probate designation. Now, naming a person as a beneficiary in an IRA avoids probate. It does. But again, does it achieve your estate planning objectives and your legacy objectives? Asset protection. Question. Yeah, Wayne, are, are there any assets that you recommend not putting in the trust? Cars. Um, except I have one client, he has 150 cars. <laughs> I have another client, he has nine Ferraris. In those cases, we do recommend, unless he's gonna sell them, to put them in the trust. So they have to send down an administrative assistant to the DMV and camp out there for a week to do the, you know. But the cars are generally not required to be. If you don't do that, would, would it be better just to put a TOD on the car? Just to make, make sure it's a, I don't There know, is no to ability to do a TOD on a car, but under Virginia law, if the only asset you have in your name is a car, mm -hmm. uh, there's a statute that allows you to go down to the to the DMV with the death certificate and the title and have it transferred. So generally, you don't have to worry about cars in Virginia. DC is another story. Is there a limitation on value then? Um, Fifty thousand dollars is the amount that can bypass probate, except cars are excluded from that if it, if that is the only asset. So, <coughs> excuse me. If you have more than if you have fifty more than fifty thousand dollars in Virginia in assets in your own name, it'll be subject to probate. So if you had a million dollar car, that avoids it. Right? If if it is used, if it is your car, and that's the only asset you have, you could technically bypass probate under that statute. A million dollar car, including um, home equity, for that fifty thousand or. Home, I mean, your home. Yeah. If the home is in your own name, yeah. you should put it in a trust. Okay. Of course. Because even though in Virginia it drops like a stone, it still has to go through a process and it may be subject to probate tax. 
does your plan protect your kid's inheritance if the spouse remarries? This is one of the questions we always ask. What do you do in the event of remarriage? How do you protect the assets? If one spouse dies and the other one is the sole trustee or the sole owner of the assets, how do you protect those assets for the benefit of the kids? It's a discussion we've had in the past. We'll continue to have it all the way through, but there are ways of protecting it by appointing a co-trustee or another trustee with the surviving spouse or other ways that we can protect the assets without destroying the estate plan. Question eight. Have you checked your beneficiary designations on your IRAs and your life insurance? Um, in the case of life insurance, we typically, if it's outside of a, an irrevocable trust, if it's just held by you individually, you can just name the revocable trust as the beneficiary, and that way it'll go be payable to the revocable trust. The surviving spouse should have access to all of those assets, but if, God forbid, she or he is in an accident with the decedent, then it's in trust automatically and it avoids probate. This is what people just, you know, they, they don't understand why I need to put it to my trust. I just give it to my, my spouse. She'll, but that's the norm. The norm is just give it to the spouse. She'll just take care of it. But sometimes the spouse is not available. Sometimes the spouse is incapacitated. Sometimes there's simultaneous death. So how do we protect it? Put it in the trust. How do you get asset protection, not only for a surviving spouse, but also for your children? Again, keeping it in trust and putting people in charge of the trust other than just the beneficiary, the spouse or the children, will give you some level of asset protection. If the child's in charge of his trust, the only protection you're gonna get is from a divorce, and that doesn't even apply in Colorado. So if there's assets in trust held for the benefit of a child, and the child is the sole trustee of his or her trust, you will get protection in the event of a divorce, but you won't get protection from other creditors. So other creditors will be able to pierce through that and get access to the assets. So you can put a co-trustee with them. And then the question is who should be the co-trustee, and it gets very convoluted. There's lots of choices that we can make in that. Is the plan income tax efficient? What I'm referring to here is the way in which we used to do uh, planning, where we would automatically allocate some of the assets to what we call a credit shelter trust or a bypass trust or a family trust that takes advantage of the tax exemption from estate tax, the $5,450,000 or whatever it is in Maryland today, $2 million or something. It's rising every year in Maryland. And in DC, again, it's a million. So how do we take advantage of that? Well, you don't use the formula of bequests as much anymore because if the estate is under 10.9 million and we force it into the family trust or the credit shelter trust, there's no step up in basis on the death of the second spouse. And so what happens is there's no estate tax because the estate's under 10.9 million and we get no basis step up for the assets that were forced into that credit shelter trust. So what we're doing today more commonly is putting it into the marital trust, which does get stepped up for te income tax basis at the death of the second spouse, but giving the second spouse the right to disclaim some of it and push it into an exempt trust where the assets are way over 10.9 million. So it's a different planning technique, Again, if it's over your head, I'll talk to you about it separately. But that is a change that we've been making commonly in our estate plans for our clients because the tax laws have changed. Income taxes are higher, estate taxes are lower, exemptions are higher. It's changed the, the ball game a lot. They're still planning with it, tax plan. And then divorcing spouses, we've talked about that. Who are the guardians? It's not just a, you know, naming your sister, naming your brother, whatever. You've got to remember that a child at the age of 14 can refuse to go with a guardian that you've designated. So you need to really think this thing through. And also, if you name your brother and sister-in-law as the guardians because the sister-in-law really knows how to raise kids, but they get divorced, what happens? So these are things that we should be talking about, you should be talking about. Ask the questions. 
and try to figure it out and then get the attorneys involved to help make changes to the documents. Again, the successor trustee is a really critical choice. It's a really big issue today. It's not as simple as it just naming your brother or your sister. In many cases, it, it, it isn't. In other cases, it is. Maybe as simple as naming your kids because you trust them and they'll do the right thing. And the assets are such that you want them to have it. That's fine. But think of what the alternatives are. Do, the, do you need asset protection? Are the assets sufficient so that they should be protected from outside creditors? This is a big one. Will the trustee that you've named do what you want them to do? I'd say 20 to 30% of the time, we see people doing the opposite, ignoring the trust. That gives the beneficiary the right to sue for breach of fiduciary duty because they haven't followed the directives and the trust. So again, understanding what the beneficiary's rights are as well as the, what the trustee is doing and who is the trustee? Are they going to do the right thing? So we want you to conduct an estate planning checkup and we want you to keep them as your clients. So this gives you another tool in your arsenal to keep your clients as your clients going forward. We want to generate more referrals for you to give to estate planning lawyers and for them to give to you and to others from this checkup process. It's always going to generate questions. Questions generate work. Work generates fees. <laughs> <laughs> Uncover additional assets under management. That's a lot of what you got what you all do, or additional financial planning fees, additional insurance needs. We're not we're not in it to sell product. We're not in it to generate revenue. We're in it to help our clients do the right things. That's why we are in it. That's why you are in it. And as fiduciaries, if you adopt that philosophy, then that's why you are in it. You're in it to help everybody. Any questions before we uh, move on? I thank all of you for taking time out from your busy schedules to be here today. And thanks for attending the estate planning boot camp. There's one next month. We're taking July and August off. We'll be back in September and October for the last two. One next month.